So um, thank you all for showing up today, Friday afternoon. Um, and thanks again to the language, uh, Columbia University Language Resource Center for inviting me here to give this talk on Languiculture. I did not change the title. I know some, I've been to talks and people change it at the last minute. I was going to, but I got on the plane and here's what I know. I'm going to tell you to talk about Languiculture, but the subtitle here is actually important. From language and culture, kind of an additive approach, an additive conceptualization of what it is that we do to a more synthetic kind of approach. And you may think that, well, I'm a language teacher, I'm a language specialist, therefore I'm going to be preaching to the converted. Everybody here all probably believes in the importance of culture in language teaching. But maybe by the end of the talk, you will think, well, you really are doing something a little bit more specific, which is the intersection of both language and culture. So um, I may, be, may or may not be speaking to the converted. Because language teachers, as I said, typically agree that language and culture are inseparable. Uh, you can't learn the language without learning the culture, and that kind of is a cliche. But in actual practice, we, meaning language teachers, separate the two of these all the time. We reify the separation in the names of our own courses, language courses and culture courses. It's in catalogs in all kinds of university programs. But I also want to situate my talk here today in kind of a moment, uh, a moment of crisis of the humanities. We've been talking about that and with, with several people here today. And my own um, searching, really, for a more integrative approach, because I think the time has come that we need to separate, uh, we need to, we need a more integrative approach. So um, let me start with this book um, that by uh, Durbin and Liddicote that just came out, Linguistics for Intercultural Education. And there have been a, a, a recent spate of books on kind of similar topics. This came out in just two years ago. And they say, despite a growing national consensus surrounding the need to develop globally competent college graduates, there is a lack of agreement about how to achieve this goal in many higher, uh, uh, American higher education institutions. Currently, many institutions, including my own, University of Texas at Austin, are caught in a paradox. They're promoting the internationalization of their curricula while simultaneously reducing foreign language culture requirements. That's happening everywhere. Um, along similar lines, surveys indicate that global studies majors and study abroad programs are growing very rapidly at American institutions. But unfortunately, those programs are increasingly conducted in English and offer only a minimal contact with the foreign language and culture. So many foreign language programs must accept, I would say, part of the blame. I know we're blaming the victim, but the state of affairs is such that we have sometimes, I believe, diminished the own impact of, of language study by emphasizing what I will claim is a structuralist knowledge at the expense of intercultural or cross-cultural competence. Current uh, instructional approaches lead students, and perhaps more importantly, administrators at universities, to view foreign language education as the memorization of static structures instead of a critical, and this comes from there, I'm citing them, um, a critical understanding of humanity's semiotic capacity for negotiating meaning with members of other cultures. That's pretty big. But that's my point. I don't think that we're getting that message across. In addition, research suggests that the field of modern language studies has long relied on a nationalist monolingual paradigm that equates a national identity with proficiency in a single standard language. So the French speak French and the Chinese speak Chinese. But these structuralist approaches are not only, I'm going to claim, essentialist, but they also separate language from its cultural context and often reinforce our students' own negative foreign stereotypes. So there was another book that came out uh, just last year, and it came out, uh, and it looked like the exact intersection of my interest, developing critical language culture pedagogies in higher education. And I'm in the process of writing a book, and I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. This book has already been written, right? Um, no, uh, it is a really interesting book, but it's really more about teacher cognition, how, how teachers are understanding how the two fit together, than it is actually um, a fully developed plan for a, a pedagogy. But here's what I want to talk about today, and I'm calling it my agenda because it really has been my thought process for the past couple of years. What is our object of study? And I mean our object as language instructors, what is it that we want our students to study? So I've been asking myself that. What is it? What is my own personal object of study? Uh, how can I define 
uh, and I'm going to say I think it is language culture. For me, it's really the intersection of the two. How can I define that? How can I then teach that? And what have I learned from what I've been trying to do for the past couple of years? I'll be sharing that. So let's get to it. My object of study then. Um, this book was very important to me. A couple of years ago, I stumbled across this book, The Language Parallax, Linguistic Relativism and Poetic Indeterminacy by Paul Friedrich, who is an anthropological linguist at uh, University of Chicago, was uh, an, uh, at the University of Chicago. And the notion of parallax is captured here. So it comes actually from astronomy, and it really simply means that an object, an object of study, looks different depending on your perspective, okay? So many people who come into languages have different, in the French word, formation, a, a kind of a background. You come from literary studies. You come from linguistics. You can come from pedagogy. You can come from now media studies. It gives you a different viewpoint on the object of study, OK? Um, I should mention, before I go on, that the notion of parallax, of course, resonates then. The la language itself is a parallax, OK? But the other important point about this book is Paul Friedrich as a linguist, he's also a poet. So that's a parallax, too. He was looking at language, kind of the referential function of language meaning, but also the poetic function. And he mentioned something really that caught my attention. He said, you know, as a poet and as an anthropologist, trying to write ethnographies to cross cultural boundaries, the hardest part was always the poetic realm. And he said, he makes a statement, he said, the, the areas of greatest divergence and greatest differences between languages and cultures are in this poetic dimension. I thought, I don't know how we can prove or disprove that assertion, but it's really an interesting one. Um, so a way of grappling with this parallactic nature of language is to talk about it in terms of atenemies or dichotomies, which is a way of grappling with how inherently um, complex language is. Okay, so we have synchrony and diachrony. So a moment, you can look at language at a moment in time or over time. You can look at it as a categorical rule. It always applies or it's a variable rule. It depends. It's a product or a process. It's langue, parole, by saussure, our updated version of competence and performance. The last, the uh, long and competence being the abstraction of a language versus its actual practice. So this got me thinking, what is, what is the student perspective? When they look at the object of study, what does it mean to them? Not only language and language learning. And I think after being in this profession for a number of years now and asking my students this question, I'd say they think of it, and by the way, I'm, I teach a lot of seniors, so people who are majoring and they come to the end of their studies and they'll say language is a system of words and grammar rules. So they separate the, the lexicon from what they now understand to be grammar. It's arbitrary, thinks Saussure. It's arbitrary, it's closed, it's static. It's conventionalized in the sense that it's a shared object. Um, but it's not made up on the spot. It's conventional. Okay? It has a meaning. And it requires lots of memorization. That's the bad part. Okay. So I actually play this game with them, a little psycholinguistic experiment. I've been doing this for a number of years. Ask them, okay, for their associations. They write down on a piece of paper the term of grammar. And, and since this is a romance language that I'm teaching, um, it's about verbs and conjugations. That's what grammar means to them. <laughs> Obviously, this depends. This game would depend on what language that they're studying. Um, and then there is uh, commas and semicolons and punctuation that comes from their high school grammar teacher, usually. And I follow that up and ask them about that. If you ask them about, you can play that game with communication. Interestingly, that triggers, that brings the word language. They associate language uh, with communication, not necessarily with grammar, but um, understanding, of course. But what's really interesting when you're looking at this kind of data is not just what's there, but what's not there. And what's not there, and I've been doing this for several years now, they don't mention people, they don't mention context, they don't mention culture. And this after, what, 20 years of communicative language teaching and we're trying to contextualize? Da, 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 da. Yes, okay, so I have to, um, as I said, starting out blaming the victim, and I'm part of the problem too. Uh, this. This little anecdote comes from uh, a textbook that I actually wrote with some graduate students. It's an intermediate textbook, Pause Café in French, and uh, 
So this is a, 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 a communicative context. Uh, from my own textbook, they were talking to each other. A hand goes up and says, Como dit how do you say cheerleader in French? In French. So I thought, ooh, teachable moment. I said, you don't. You wouldn't say it because that doesn't exist. It's not part of the cultural frame. Like, OK, but <laughs> you told me I'm supposed to do this stupid activity. I'm supposed to tell this other person what I did. I went to a football game, and there was a cheer. How do I say cheerleader in French? So I started talking about, well, it depends. You could circumlocute because if you're talking to a French person and they don't have that, in and they said, but I'm not talking to a French person. I'm talking. I know that's the problem. You're talking to an American, and they already know what a cheerleader is, and that this is a problem. So that's the point of some of these communicative activities is they're still highly contrived, and they reduce the complexity of the context. So I started thinking, how can I, def um, how can I teach language culture, but more specifically, how can I define it in order to be able to talk to my students about it? So let's go back to Friedrich. He says uh, in another an article, and I'll just read through this, a domain of experience that fuses and intermingles the vocabulary semantic aspects of grammar and the verbal aspects of culture, both grammar and culture have underlying structure while they are constantly being used and constructed by actual people on the ground. I will refer to this uni unitary but at other levels internally differentiated domain or whole as lingua culture. I've actually shifted, now there's variation in language, lingua, lingua. Um, I don't use the term lingua culture because it, for many people it brings up connotations of linguistics and that's not what I'm going or concretely, Greek lingua culture, rural southern Vermont lingua culture, and so forth. OK, so that was, a ninth, that was the end of the 80s. And then this book was published in 94 called Language Shock, Understanding the Culture of Conversation. It was popularizing the notion of, of lingua culture. Michael Agar is an ethnographer who was worked for uh, most of his career at the University of Maryland. And he writes, Language in all its varieties and all the ways it appears in everyday life builds a world of meanings. So he uh, puts it in a more kind of uh, informal way than, than um, Friedrich, but he emphasizes the notion of meaning, coming into language as a universe of meanings. The lingua in lingua culture is about discourse, not just about words and sentences. And the culture in lingua culture is about meanings that include but go well beyond what the dictionary and the grammar offer. But one of the major points of this book, of Agar, is to argue against the legacy, the problems raised by a Saussurean notion or understanding of language. And so, of course, Saussure was the seminal figure in linguistics who changed the field. Um, and he writes, Saussure laid the foundation stones for modern linguistics. He was one of the key figures who sculpted the modern era out of the 19th century. But he set up the circle around language when he threw out speech, parole, in favor of language, long, so the abstract system. So the metaphor of the circle, he drew the circle, and that's what we do with fields. We say, this is the boundary of the field. Here's what's inside it. I'm going to call this language, and the other stuff, no. OK, so fast forward. Jim Lantoff is a well-known figure in second language acquisition, coming from a sociocultural perspective. And he said, you know, if we talk about proficiency, we have to talk about uh, culture. So he writes about the circle, and again, this is the notion, this is Agar's notion of the social drawing the circle. He said, the circle compelled us, and he's talking to language specialists, to think of language as only what exists inside its boundaries. What's outside the circle is something other than language, for example, culture. Little wonder that language learning, teaching, and assessment have been understood as something apart from learning, teaching, and assessment of culture. Okay, and my journey then took me to Kieran Riesiger, also at the same year published as Lantoff, and she's published several books. She's a, a Danish sociolinguist and has written several books about language and, and culture pedagogy. Here, what's important is the subtitle, From a National to Transnational, so moving away from a monolingual national paradigm, French for the French, uh, looking at languages as transnational uh, in this era of superdiversity. And what was important for me, though, is that Riesiger takes this universe of meaning and divides it into three domains. The first domain is semantic and pragmatic meaning, which usually correlates with the study of anthropology and linguistics. 
Um, so talking about the here and now, pointing like how many windows are in the room, that's referential meaning. The identity dimension, because every time you open your mouth and say something, people situate you in a social universe. So who are you, where are you coming from, so forth, sociolinguistics. And the third one, the poetic dimension, which is literary criticism, aesthetics, poetics. Um, okay, so, okay, that's what I mean by lingual culture. So the how do I teach this? And the notion of the pedagogical imperative, why should I care about teaching this? comes to us from the MLA report uh, published in 2007. Now, they did not use the word lingua culture, but I think that they actually should. Um, so they say that the goal now of higher education, foreign languages, should be translingual, transcultural competence. And this has been a game that applied linguists have been playing now for a couple of years. So we went from intercultural competence to translingual competence to symbolic competence. We keep talking about competence, but my point is I think that the object of study has remained the same. So it's not really had that much impact on the field, the practice of the field. But there's this uh, quote here that I pulled out that the point we should, and language programs should systematically teach differences in meaning, mentality, and worldview. This sounds very Sapir Whorfian, as expressed in American English and in the target language. Okay, so I think that the MLA report was trying to, now in my vernacular, erase the circle. I think that's what they want us to do. But if you do that, all hell breaks loose. And um, again, let me cite Lantoff. He says, once the circle around language is erased and we begin to think in terms of lingual culture rather than language and culture, meaning becomes far more prominent than it is inside the circle. This has consequences for how we conceptualize learning and proficiency. Outside the circle, the domain of language culture entails knowledge of different concepts and how those are encoded in such features as metaphors, lexical networks, lexicogrammatical structures, schemas, and the like. So he goes on and says, we're not teaching this currently. We're really not doing this. This book was also finally bringing us up to the, uh, just a couple of months ago. It's also important for me because it, it has, first of all, the word pedagogical imperative. It's important for us to actually take these kind of interesting ideas, the theoretical ideas, but turn them into a practice. And the notion of research and practice, of course, here he uses the sociocultural term or the Vygotskian term praxis. So they're in a dialectic. But what I took from this book is actually the notion of concept-based instruction. So let me turn now and get a little pedagogical. How do I teach language culture? Okay, so I've adopted concept-based instruction. And here, abstract concepts serve as the basic units of instruction. So instead of always starting from form and thinking about, today I'm gonna to be teaching narrative past tenses, what you really want to think about teaching is aspect, aspectual differences, or the concept of narration, or even perspective taking, so which are much more cognitive in orientation. So a lot of this, by the way, is borrowing heavily from uh, cognitive linguistics. So these abstract concepts, such as as aspectual distinctions or narration, must be verbalized in one's own words. It doesn't help to import a bunch of gobbledygook from linguistics. What they do is memorize that, but they don't understand it. So it's important that they verbalize it. And then one step further is that they have to be, I like this word, didacticized. Um, and there are different ways to do that. One of the ways that they talk about is to actually turn it into a diagram or some kind of an image. So also, they talk about it in terms of CBI, concept-based instruction, as some kind of a sequence. So we present the concept. And they usually don't understand it at all because it's an abstraction. And then we have some kind of activities that are dialogic, not a dialogue in a textbook, right? So because meaning is dialogic, it's very Bakhtinian in that notion. So they understand the concepts by trying to verbalize it to somebody else in small groups. And then we have lots of activities where they try to internalize it, that is apply, looking at using real language and apply these concepts. Okay, and then the whole process is very iterative because I just recycle all of these concepts throughout the remaining, remainder of the semester. So 
what does that look like? So here's one of our concepts. We're talking about the notion of semiotics, and I introduced this famous taxonomy of signs. I distinguish the difference between an icon, an index, and a symbol. I think it's important that, that students of language at a higher institution know this. Um, so on the, on, the, on the left here, the meaning is, so we see we have two columns, right? It means put, male, man, different type, okay, and female, so forth. But they mean, the signs mean differently, right? So icons are a relationship of similarity. It looks like the object that it means. Here, the object is a relationship in a relationship of contiguity or proximity. Metonymy. Huh? Metonymy. Metonymy. And then, of course, the famous symbol of social um, arbitrariness. OK. So we talk about that. How would that apply? We also talk about here is then going into the next stage of dialogue. Remember their ideas. They had to turn it into something that, meant, that was personal for them. Here is somebody trying to explain the notion of complexity to their neighbor. And each of the, you can, it doesn't show up very well, but it says infinity, 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 so it keeps going. And finally, trying to internalize this, we actually have a text, different kinds of texts. So texts are, are, are not just written, they're also oral. We're looking at multimodal texts. And I want them to exemplify what is it, is that's an example of what, an icon or complexity or what are the concepts, and then explain how it applies. Um, very important, obviously, is since I'm using real language data, is to contextualize everything because language is, for me, context. So this is how it works. I'm teaching this course right now, not today, actually, since I'm here in New York. Um, but it's called the Introduction to French Linguistics. So caution. Um, I'm talking about a senior level course, and people are after the, in the Q&A will probably ask me, so how can this be adapted to lower level? Well, that's, that's the work for all of us to do. But anyhow, this focus today is on a senior level class. I'm teaching them these different concepts. I start off by asking for their definitions of language and culture, which is really interesting. I, I would, whatever level you are, I think you should ask them, what do, you, what do you think those two words mean to you? And then I ask them for their language culture biographies. And everybody shares their language culture biographies with each other. And then we have a couple of three weeks where I present the leading concepts. Then we use those concepts to understand semantic and pragmatic meaning, social meaning, poetic meaning, and then they do their final projects. So let me show you what this looks like. For the most part, a language, uh, this is then a, a very a small sample of a definition. For the most part, a language is grammar structure in a set of words, so we have that dichotomy grammar, words, or the lexicon, used by people that is mutually intelligible between a group of individuals. So this is pretty intelligent, uses the criteria of mutually intelligibility, pretty good. Um, language culture biography, I'll just give you a little snippet here. They're usually about two pages long. My mother was raised speaking French as a first language. My father wasn't. I was raised speaking English in my family's home. And aside from exposure to certain words of endearment and phrases that became a part of my mother's idiolect, Ooh, OK. So he's had some kind of maybe linguistics. I don't know, but that tells me something. It was only through extended family gatherings that I came into contact with the language. My father's linguistic upbringing and mine were pretty similar. At least one, one of our parents spoke French, but the, family was, uh, but the language was rarely spoken at home, leaving us in early life to pick up what we did through extended family gatherings. My father never became bilingual like my mother. He does have a decent handle on how to curse, though, as though many English-speaking Canadians do. And so we learn a lot of information from this. This is just a paragraph of two-page lingua culture uh, biography. And he knows how to curse very well uh, in Quebec uh, French, Quebecois French. OK, so here are the concepts that I'm introducing. And not just for this course, but I think they're actually important for language learning. And the challenge is to figure out how we can import them uh, and turn this into a pedagogy right from the very beginning. Complexity, because languages are inherently complex. Prototypes, cultural frames, semiotics or semiosis, formulaicity and acceptability. So let me say really quickly about what those concepts are. When I say complexity, so almost all of my students use the word system when they would describe, these are seniors describing language. They say language and culture are systems. 
but none of them say complex systems, and that's important to me. So a complex system has these five traits. It's open to external influence. It's heterogeneous. Yes, they all be, may, birds may be uh, the same species, but there are differences between the birds. It's dynamic. The flock of birds always is changing. Without a leader, it's still it's changing. And it's adaptive. So it, if some change happens over here, it's going to be uh, trigger an adaptation over there. And it's nonlinear, meaning you've heard of the butterfly effect. So a small change can trigger, have huge consequences in the system. Prototypes. The next thing they need to understand is we're pulling conceptual information out of our minds, and the, the information is always structured. OK, so here's an obvious prototype of a bird. And it's based then in, on um, cultural uh, experience. So languages can never give you synonymy because you always have different cultural experience. Okay, so get over that. There is no synonymy in languages, okay? Cultural frames, going back to my student who wanted to say cheerleader. I wanted to tell him what I was trying to say is if you say cheerleader, then you have to evoke the entire frame of a football game. So cheerleaders are only understandable if you understand everything else here, okay? So, in communicating cross-culturally or interculturally, you may want to evoke a frame that gets close to that, okay? A French football game, let's see. Semiotics, we were moving away from Saussure's arbitrary signs to the notion of semiosis, which is the process of always making meaning in the moment. And this, of course, is Charles Sanders Peirce, who was writing, he was contemporary of Saussure, um, but had a much more expansive vision of semiotics than Saussure, which was focused on the most conventionalized and linguistic signs. So here's a very important quote. Nothing is a sign unless it's interpreted as a sign. So you have to have people in the picture. Signs don't exist without people. Formulaicity, I'll give you a second to read that. Collective groan, okay. <laughs> so it all turns, of course, on the formula or the collocation or the fixed expression of mistaken identity. Identity, so four syllables, anemone, ha ha. So it works, the, uh, formulaicity is like the key to native likeness. And so a lot of times at this level, my students are writing grammatical French, but it's not, it's not formulaic French, okay? So that's really important for them to understand when they're looking at lingual cultures. It's close, but it's not exactly, okay? And finally, the last concept, instead of grammaticality, I emphasize acceptability. And since I teach a lot of students who are actually Spanish speakers learning French, I'm in Texas after all, I have lots of great um, anecdotes that they give me about this notion of acceptability. I had one kid this past semester who said, he uses the two form with one set of grandparents and the usted form with the other. And he said uh, he actually made a mistake when he was six years old with his maternal grandparents. He used the wrong form. And his mother said, don't do that. That's, and he said, but that's what I used with, with the other set. And she said, well, they're crazy. Don't do that. <laughs> so the point being that you need to negotiate language use, and it changes. It's highly context variable. OK. So as I said, I do an iterative application of all of these six concepts through different kinds of meaning, different kinds of text. And through all of them, I'm trying to point them to the fact that there are patterns at all these different interacting levels, which is complexity. So lexical patterns, how they choose a word, is it positive or negative, the notion of valence. Grammatical patterns, what kind of sen sentential frame, discursive patterns, how do you want to structure your argument, interactional patterns and conceptual patterns. It's all connected. So at this point, they're totally overwhelmed by all this. This is pretty heavy. So let me show you actually how I work on this. Um, so for a lot of the semantic 
pragmatic stuff, we've been using Cultura, which comes to you from MIT. It's an open educational resource. And since I'm the director of the Center for Open Educational Resources, I want to use as many open products as possible. Um, it exists in other languages besides French and English, uh, and it's grown. We actually now have 20 years of, of the data. between. This is essentially a, a first, one of the first and most well-known examples of telecollaboration. So uh, MIT students and the French version of MIT students at Ecole Polytechnique, and now it's grown to many other French universities. It turns out that students at MIT do not represent America, okay, which is a very important point. They are two groups of people who are talking from different cultures, but they do not have to rep they don't have the burden of representing an entire language or entire culture. That's taken off the table right away. But there are cultural patterns that we see right away. So this, of course, is the, the game that I was playing earlier on with my students with the associations. These are all associations with individualism. These are all French associations with individualisme. So you can add an E, it changes the valence. It, change, it goes from highly positive to highly negative. So we kind of just now scrape the data off of the web and we dump it in something called a word cloud and we can start to look at this. And now here it starts to take shape, a prototype. This is a, this is a category. Uh, individualism, then, you can see, you can paraphrase it as the expression of the self's unique, I don't know, uniqueness. You're free to express yourself. Um, a couple of things. This is somewhat diffuse in that there's not just one. There's several different semantic factors coming here. If you compare that to the French, boom. Egoisme. So this basically means selfishness in French. I think it's a much so it's a false cognate, actually, they're learning. Um, so not only is there one central member of the prototype, egoisme, and you also have then egoist and egocentrisme. So if you're just looking at that, ego morpheme, it gets even bigger. So it has a shape. Um, the French, if you dig down deeper and look at the different things, uh, different words, you find that the Americans are able to uh, conceptualize individualism as just the self. The French itself in relation to somebody else. It's a relational concept. So they always, when they talk about the individual, it's always with, they have words like société, which never appear in the, in the data cloud for the Americans. These lexical patterns are related to grammatical patterns because uh, the Americans, this is uh, 10 years of data, I ran a little analysis. They talk about, they use the word I, and the French rarely use the, the pronoun je. Okay, That jumps out at you. Uh, it's highly si significant when you run statistics on it. Um, and it gets to the point, when I've taught with this, uh, actually with Cultura, where the American, about midway through the semester, the French say, you know you Americans are so arrogant. You're talking about yourself all the time. I, 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 I. It's all about you. And the French are doing their French thing, which is thèse, antithèse, synthèse, and they're saying, they're saying, this is what I hear you say, and however, on the other hand, and, and they also are using impersonal expressions. It is important that one must blah, blah, blah. So they're communicating, but they're completely out of sync. Um, and the, 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 the French, as I was saying, complain that the Americans are arrogant, but the Americans are saying the same thing of the French, because, of course, how dare you talk down to me? I, you know, you're pretending that you're some kind of professor. Just t tell me about yourself. Okay. Very different patterns of argumentation. Um, I was giving a talk in, in France a couple of years ago, and a French professor said, Mais on fait la classe de philo. He said, so they're doing, they're doing philosophy class. That's how we're trained to do it, exactly that. Um, this also correlates them with interactional patterns. So because the Americans are making statements about themselves, it's not just I, I what, I think, I believe, I. So yes, the, the French, when they do say I, they say things like je pense, je crois, epistemics. But the Americans talk about how they feel, and the French never do, in this context. So the French are saying, I'm so surprised, I'm so curious, I'm so shocked. And the French are, it is important to remember that one must, okay. So those are the kinds of activities that we're doing to understand social, uh, to understand semantic and pragmatic meaning. Let's go to social meaning, which is where we're finishing that uh, right now. And when I started this unit, 
Uh, this was, of course, published uh, October 5th. This appeared, and it was perfect, because it was actually, this article was written by a linguist here in the New York area, and he talks about the notion of indexicality and the social meaning of accents and so forth. And in, in, in September and early October, it was good to have a New York accent. Apparently, in Iowa, it's not so good anymore, so, which is great, because that also shows the dynamics of social meaning. But this is exactly what they don't have. They don't have the experience to understand all the social complexity of, of language. So what I, I have to get inventive, and one of the things that I'm using is this film, Bon Cop, Bad Cop. Anybody know this one? OK, this is a great film. Um, well, no, it's not a great film. <laughs> it's a good film for teaching social meaning embedded in a context. And the context here, of course, is the competition between Ontario and Quebec. And instead of tell, uh, talking about this, let me uh, jump out of this and show you what I do. Oh, here we go. So let me show you the play, you just a little bit of the trailer of Bon Cop, Bad Cop, and it appeared in 2005, I believe. Okay, so that was the first time they met each other. David Ward, he's the Anglophone, and David Bouchard says, David Bouchard. So he's already mocking him right from the very beginning by saying, okay, I can do an Anglophone accent too. So there's so much language play and it goes so quickly that we go through it scene by scene and talk, why did he do that and what does that mean? This heart is in Quebec, yes, but this ass belongs to you. <laughs> <laughs> Their cultures don't match. The subject divorce, which is about 75 hours a week, which I get from Montreal, is a lot. Their styles don't blend. I started with that. It's really new. I can't work with this clown. Call me around the air. What's your name, please? Tragic killer. And when the case becomes personal, I'm your names. I'll find you. I have the full box of rock. Opposites attack. Okay, you've seen enough. You get, you get the point. So this is a buddy film, a cop film. These are two guys who are thrown together and have to be partners. But what I have my students do is actually look at all the code switches here. They have, a, they have difficulty understanding the dialect, the French dialect. Quebecois French is significantly different than, than European varieties of French. So, but, but they can handle code switching. And so we talk a little bit about the context, the stereotypes. This is not authentic data. This is a representation of what's going on. That's an important point for them to understand. So, but as they start off using language, it's very stereotyped, and it becomes much more negotiating their developing relationships. So that's so social, what I mean by looking at social meaning. Let me go back uh, and end now, kind of come back to... Uh, Poetic meaning, <clears throat> and for poetic meaning, which we'll be starting next week for the next for, um, for November, I'm using. So I'll give a little shout out to. This is something. Um, this is an OER that was actually produced by uh, um, Joanna Lux at Cornell University, and her her idea was to um, begin some kind of literary or critical analysis of some kind of poetic dimension from the very beginning. And she said that really doesn't exist in most textbooks today, unfortunately. Um, and so her idea, it's a really interesting conceit in that she said, you know, uh, what I want them to do is not necessarily look at canonical literature, but I want them to look at everyday discourse that has literary qualities, which is much more ac accessible to them. So she's looking at things off the internet, or she's uh, looking at ordinary conversation that has interesting metaphors.
Um, by the way, this exists right now as a product on Google Docs, so anybody can download it and use it, turn it into a Word document, and go in and change it. That's the point of open. And we're trying to train other people in how to play along with this, uh, how to play the game of, of open educational resources. And we've now developed a, a website called Foreign Languages and the Literary in the Everyday. So it's not just for French. It's a construct that kind of works for all kinds of languages. Um, and so I'm, we're working with Coral, and there's another National Foreign Language Resource Center at Arizona Circle that is working with us, and they're doing German and Spanish. So we hope to have more. And if, if you're interested in more information, I can talk about this later on. So one of the activities that I do um, for this, uh, the poetic kind of um, dimension, is I, have, I give them various poetic texts. This is a very famous poem by Éluard, uh, Liberté. And what I'm using, I'm also showing you another OER, another open educational resource, which is a tool for collaborative annotation. Markup. You can take a text, and this is available. Anybody can use this if you'd like. Um, it's a product that we developed at Coral, but it essentially turns the text into a space, a, a space online. So imagine all of your students marking up the same text together. That's what we're doing. It's collaborative annotation. It's another tool for close reading of a literary text. Now, that's the humanities, right? So anyhow, what we see here is that we also, it generates word clouds. It, uh, so lots of people have annotated this line. This is the last stanza in the poem. So it, I can see at a glance where they're interested, what parts of the text uh, grab their attention. And um, I'll just show you, go back into English so everybody can understand. So this is a text that I did a demonstration with a couple of years ago at a conference, Jabberwocky. And so somebody underlines the word frumious, bandersnatch, and writes, so Pierre, I gave them all different names. Pierre, adjective, from the verb, to frum, frumine. And so he's playing around, obviously. So somebody, you can write back and say, well, so what does frum mean? Well, it means to exhale sulfur, duh, of course. Okay, so the point, uh, I'm trying to show here is that they actually mark it up and then talk to each other about their markups. So what I do is I give the text Liberté to different groups of interpreters, native, non-native, mixed, and see where the conversation goes. Because what this actually can do is you can produce a transcript of all the interactions. That's what they actually look at, is how they interpret poetics in the moment. So what have I learned so far from trying all these ideas out? I think it's really important that we create some kind of new meta-language because we have a meta-language of received categories of grammar that have been around for a long time. But to get at the other dimensions, we have to borrow from other fields, from discourse analysis, conversation analysis, other different kinds of fields that are still new, multimodality, and so forth. And there's a very, it's, a very, it's very powerful to learn a term, to name a term. And this is, many of my students, when they're looking at the data in Cultura or whatever, they don't see things. And I think part of this, they don't have a label for some of the things that they're seeing. So I know from my own experience in taking art history, and I'm learning new terms, whether it's Italian or it's a French term, where here the contrast of light and dark. And then you say, there it is, there's clair obscure, there it is, I can start to see it. I think they knew, we need a new meta-language. And the other important principle that I've learned is I think language teaching should start with meaning, not with form. And this is huge. I think um, the problem that I think is that when you start with form, you never get out of form. You stay with form. And that's linguistics. You go from form to form to form to form. There are no people. There, are, there is no context. It's just form. So if you start with meaning, then that means that you need to do a good job of really talking about meaning. And that's where I think um, we need to do a better job. Uh, I think it's important that we dissolve some of these dichotomies. They're inherent in the way we talk about languages. Um, but I've been inspired by a number of different people. Um, Leo Van Leer is one of my heroes, and he talks about language and context, you said, no, that dichotomy doesn't make sense. It's all context. You, it's like an onion, right? That's his metaphor. You keep peeling an onion down, layer after layer, and it's like, oh, wait a second. It's all layers. It's just all context all the way down, as he says. But um, Diane Larson Freeman also talks about kind of a dissolving dichotomies that have been around for a long time, product versus 
process. She said, it's, it's really more like emerging patterns all the time. Language is always emerging. Vocabulary versus grammar, as my students said, all of my students say that. You have grammar and vocabulary. It's more lexical grammar because words then trigger sentential frames. They're, they're always, they fit together. Ah, embrace reality. So, okay, bon cop, bad cop is not reality. Um, and I'm using that, and I put that in quotation marks and say this is a representation of reality. But let's stop with um, pedagogical materials that use actors at the beginning, and it's all fake. Students know it's fake, because reality is so much more interesting. So I use all, as much ethnographic materials as I possibly can, because they're rich. I think we need to really do a much better job enriching the context. My own textbook, as I said at the very beginning, has a lot of, now I'm looking at it and say, well, of course, these so, the contexts are so impoverished. So let me give you um, an example, I think, uh, of a better, of one of these attempts at a better con contextualization. And this is actually from, um, you can see at the URL, this is the, there's a method site at Coral we published, uh, and it has a unit on pragmatics, so contextualizing language. So this is what I mean by enriching a context. Whenever you communicate, there's always a backstory. You have motivations, and the person you're talking to have motivations, and they're complicated, and they may change. So here, imagine the following situation. You have an important dinner to attend tonight. You need to borrow your friend Anna's car because you have wrecked yours. The last time you borrowed it, you put a small dent in it. Uh-oh. Uh, uh, what do you want to say to her to get the car? Okay, so this is not a dialogue. He's just going to be given a task, but I want you to watch. Unfortunately, the, 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 the um, captions aren't working, but it's only a minute, so if you don't speak Spanish, that's okay. We'll go over really quickly what this means. It's very important that my friend has your car. I have your car now for this night. So it's really important that I have this car for tonight. And He's trying to say, I'm sorry, I had some accidents, I know. It's not my fault, it's not my fault. So it's very safe, your car with me is very safe. Yeah, yeah, he said that I didn't have shocks from my culpa, nunca, nunca veces, nada veces. <laughs> nada veces, nunca veces. It's never my fault. It's not, it's not my fault. I've never, I had these accidents. Oh, I, I forgot. I, was, I talked over the last part. He said, Dame tu coche, por favor. Give me your car, please. Okay, so he was trying to say it, but he doesn't have the skills yet to uh, mitigate it. So it's not terribly polite at the end. So what we do is use these kinds of videotapes with them actually in some kind of more lifelike interaction. And they can actually talk and, and listen to each other and say, how was that as a performance? Um, okay, so the, the point being, this is a more enriched context than you typically find in most textbooks. Okay, so let me finish up here. Um, I said, enrich context. And the next thing is go meta. That was actually meta. We turned that into a meta activity by showing it to the students and then act, asking them to kind of unpack it a little bit. One of the things that I've been doing with a colleague in Spanish is looking at kind of what, what would be called intercultural pragmatics. So here is a native speaker of Spanish from Colombia, and here is our American student. And I, am, I'm, I won't play the, the videotape for you. But you can see that what we're doing is we have them interact, and actually we have them talk about individualism or child-rearing practices or whatever. And we're looking for cultural divisions and divides and we're evoking cultural frames. And then immediately after that, we have them watch it again. So this is them watching them, right, communicating. And what I do is I ask, ask them lots of targeted questions to, get, to prompt them. 
So why did you smile and why did you nod and why are you doing that? To get them to actually think a little bit about the process of communication. That's what I mean by going meta. And finally, the whole point of my talk is integrating. So let me end with um, one of my, a quote from one of my colleagues, Janet Swafar, uh, who taught for many years in Germanic studies. And Janet wrote a really, I think, a great piece in 1999. So these ideas, these are not brand new ideas, none of them. I'm quoting from many people. Um, but she says, foreign, foreign language study is a discipline with four subfields, language, literature, linguistics, and culture, that asks the question, how do individuals and groups use words and other sign systems in context to intend, negotiate, and create meanings? Within this definition, I'm not talking about linguistics alone. I'm suggesting that our profession must derive principles of foreign language study from the expanded social core of language and communities, and that's what I've been working on. The goal of our discipline is to en enable students to recognize the various intentionalities behind verbal and written text and to use language effectively to achieve their own purposes within a cultural community." End quote. So she wrote that in 1999. It was published in the ADFL Bulletin, The Case for Foreign Languages as a Discipline. It was republished a year, a year later in the MLA profession. And I think, um, so we're still talking about that. I can see that I think the field is moving towards this integration. I think we are in, um, uh, as I said at the very beginning, kind of a historical moment. We're losing enrollment, we're losing faculty. And so I know for my own department, we are finally, because there are only a handful of us now left standing in each of these fields, we are finally beginning to work together. So that's the positive note. And so let me ask for, I'll end with this, the Q&A, but I have to have a picture of my hero, Roman Jakobson, who started his career in literary criticism and then discovered linguistics, but he was always a linguist, as he said, which meant to him a language lover. They're all manifestations of this huge beast called language. Thank you.